this okay. Speed cubus is the old term. Nowadays things change in speed cuber, but it's a technical distinction. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of the speed cuber at this conference. I met Tom Rogers at a, a meetup uh, organized at the IBB, and he invited me here. And unfortunately, there's none others, um, but that means if anybody has any questions about speed cube, you just come up to me anytime. Um, that's why I'm here for. Um, I'm actually going to keep this a little short and just mention one thing. I was originally going to go over how uh, this, which behaves like a 3x3 when I do this, is actually resolvable with another homomorphism and whatnot, but I won't go over that. Also, who knows what a Sune is? No. Okay, quite a few people. Uh, who knows what a commutator is? Okay. Normally it's the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was terrible out, uh, you can write the student easily as a sequence of two commutators, but most people don't know it can be written as one. And that's an example. This was something I came up with in mathematics a while ago. Anyhow, one other fun thing I wanted to mention that I think would appeal to this crowd. Um, you take the number of states on a Rubik's Cube, which uh, you can find proofs for in Sing Master's book or anywhere, uh, which is equal to that. And obviously that's not a prime number, right? So there's a lot of things. So now if we take the number of unsaved solved states in a Rubik's Cube, so there's exactly one solved state, and everything else I can do to this is unsolved. This is a prime number. Whoa. Yeah, so if you know the prime number theorem, the chances of that are about 2%. And uh, if you calculate this for other cube orders, so you go up to 7 by 7 and higher, I went up to about 50. And only the n equals 11 cube has the same property. And then I checked Yap's database, and a lot of other puzzles don't seem to have this property. So I don't know why the cube. Chris Hardwick really found this interesting uh, little <laughs> numerical tidbit. The number of unsolved states in a cube is a prime number. Anyhow, uh, this is, I think, what I wanted to talk about the most uh, to explain to this audience, I think, would be this. Um, there are a bunch of aspects to speed cubing. And the most interesting for me is blindfold solving. And I'll explain to you how conventional blindfolded solving works, because I think you can understand it. and then. It really helps when you have an idea of what it's like rather than absolutely no idea of what kind of structure it goes into it. But most of you know that the Rubik's Cube is comprised of pieces. I can take this one apart. And then, for example, there's these edges. And so here I've got a lineup of edges. And so there's 12 edges on the cube. And you don't have to consider them being on the cube. You can just imagine the positions being numbered. And so here I've got an arrangement of 12 edges that represents the state on the cube. And for now, I'm going to ignore everything except where the edges are. So each one might as well be a number. And when you solve it blindfolded, what you do is you get a random position. And uh, you don't use your normal speed solving method. Uh, the approach that people use is uh, they decompose it into cycles. So I look at this cube, and I see, for example, here that the uh, piece of position 2 uh, uh, this goes, uh, the, the piece in the first position is a position 1, and it needs to go to 2. And then at 2, there's a 1, and it needs to go back. So if you look at the cycle structure down here, 2 goes to 1. And if you've seen, and if you've done more group theory, this is familiar. You take the piece of position 12, which goes to 5, which is 7, and you get these other structures. And it turns out to be really easy to generate three cycles on a cube. So I can take, uh, let's take this blank cube. There are exactly three edges affected by this these three. And if I know how to affect these three alone, I can uh, cycle them. And this turns out to be useful in, uh, if you know the cycle structure of a cube. Because, for example, C12, 5, 7 is a cycle. So let's take, I, say I take the permutation and I perform 12 goes to 5 goes to 7, which means I just set up the pieces and do what I just did. And then I look at the permutation again. It's changed. And that cycle is now shorter. And the way you resolve it is you take the cycle structure, and you just decompose it, and you solve the pieces in order. So at any time, you know where all the pieces are, and you take a few pieces, and you place them. And then you do that again, and again, and eventually everything is placed. There's a few more details in that, for example, this corner here can be facing different directions, like this, or this, or this. And uh, you normally resolve this by just having canonical orientation. So I just see that these three are white up. And now all the corners here have white or yellow up or down. And so if I make sure to keep them facing that way and put them into the correct position each, I know all of the cube will be solved. And so you first get that, and then you do the cycle structure. And that's about how blindfolded solving works.
And I think I'm not going to go over much else. I'm just going to say, if, you, if there's anything you want to ask me about any time during the conference, come up. Um, I'd be happy to let you try these. I'd be happy to show you how to solve any of these. Um, solve how to solve them. Demonstrations, please. Yes, I'm getting into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ask me any of these things if, if anything looks intriguing sometime. Um,